Welcome to the Cowboy Office Show, where you'll experience expert analysis and epic discussion on key pillars of the equine industry, including sports, business, hobby, and the horse lifestyle. Your co-hosts are Jody Brainerd and Brian Dyker, industry veterans with over 120 years combined living the cowboy lifestyle. The Cowboy Office Show will help you get involved, ask more questions, and create change. We'll keep riding for you as together we learn from the ride already ridden, learn to listen better to our horse, and make our industry better for all. Each weekly episode, we'll take a ride around the industry in less time than you can load the truck and trailer. Drop your email at cowboyoffice.com to receive weekly updates and never miss an episode. Settle up as we ride into today's show. Well, hello, reigning world. I believe we've made it. As a sport, I think we have grown up. Kind of like a graduation ceremony that lasts a f- few years. Just do it, and it can be yours. That's what we're seeing over three years of great competition and getting even better. Welcome to the Cowboy Office. I'm Brian. And I'm Jody. Welcome. You know, we thought the American Performance Horseman was, you know, history being made, uh, and we just keep seeing it happen again and again. You know, the run for a million qualifier was another great rain in I, I think, you know, Brian, you and I watched it last year. We thought it was the greatest rain we've ever seen. This one was, I think, arguably even better. Um, you know, when, you, when you're qualifying in March for a finals in August to run at that much money and you add to that non-professional riders beating the open riders, <laughs> and, and here, uh, here I'm going to go because it's a spot in our show that I get to talk about it. And, you know, our viewing audience has, has heard me in the past, you know, on more than one occasion say that the, you know, the leveling of the competition needs to be done with horsepower instead of with riders' right. earnings in, in both in the non-pro and the open. Um, there's no greater proof of that here. We have a, we have a non-pro rider that actually won this competition. Um, we had another one, uh, you know, multi-million dollar non-pro rider that um, is made the finals. Both of these girls have a huge chance to, you know, win a half a million dollars. Um, and from a horse trainer standpoint, a guy that's been in this for a really, really long time, I I would make good argument that, you know, a non-pro rider of that caliber and able to have access to that kind of horse can come in my competition and take my money away from me. <laughs> I can't go get in yours, right? I mean, and these two girls just proved that they can beat 90 of the best riders and horses in the world, not just the United States, because we had plenty yeah. of international competitors too. So, yeah. yeah, it's a spot that, you know, for me, I've said it in the past, you know, non-pro rider, you want to come into the open, that's what Luca did. He said, I'm an open rider. You want to come right. in, you ought to have access to winning a half a million dollars. That's where you need to stay. Pick, yeah. your, pick your poison. Anyway. Yep. Yeah. Well, well, I your point's very valid. I think it's going to be a big conversation between now and August, no doubt. Um, and so, you know, Gina Marie wins the qualifier. She showed up at the Run for the Million, I think it was last year as well. But that concept of the non-pro being in the open, and then what does that mean from an industry standpoint? I I. I, I your point's very valid. I would love to for you and I to spend some time and possibly do a show on the non-pro and leveling because the leveling sections, um, both in the non-pro and the open, but then non-pro purses versus open purses and the purse structure and all of that. So I think that there's a, a, a lot to be done there. Um, So we'll look at that. Let's keep going, though, for a touch, because I think it is fascinating. One, they're both women. Two, they're both non-pros. And you got two non-pros that make the top ten and whoop the daylights out of 98 pros. So you're right. Absolutely. Skill, Skill level is all at the same place, and it's all about... Horsepower and partnership with your horse. Exactly. You're 100 percent correct. If you have access to it, you can you can drive the race car. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> you know, it's uh, this is this is something too. And and you know, Brian, he he is my stat man, right? And he's the guy that you know that compiles the statistics. And and I think you know he's got some great graphs that are are going to help us visualize this stuff. And and the horses that we saw and the judging that was done. 
in this uh, at this particular competition. I think probably something that you've probably heard me say until it gets a little bit old, but, you know, the judging is very near and dear to our hearts. And, you know, one of my favorites is that you can't have too much education. And the other is that the correct answer is almost always in the middle. And I think that um, some of the things that Brian has compiled um, will prove that. And no matter what level we're looking at, but especially this one, because it's, we had it's some, actually, yeah. go ahead. You're right. And being that, well, no, you're right. And you're, the two things that you say all the time and emphasize, one is education. You never educate too much. And then two, that the general answer is in the middle. And so that's very applicable in all of these forces. But mathematically and with our scoring system, that's also proving to be true. And I would just take your middle to an averaging because when you take data points and put more data points in and look at average – not median because the median is the midpoint where half of the sampling is above and half is below. But when you put all the sampling in and get a true average, and that's what we're looking at now. And because of the depth of competition, and I use all five officials, they're the experts. We hire five, we use five, there's no hiding and reigning, and I'm analyzing all five data points across the run even though when you get to the end of the run the cumulative score we drop the high and the low and yet and you sum the middle that's what we're doing what we're talking about in the data analysis is making us think about how do we take the officiating and elevate it advance it so that it can stay on par with the depth of competition and you and i've been talking about this for five years now it's here the graduation ceremony of the sport of reigning is now five years long. We're still hooping and hollering because it's getting better. We just saw a hundred head of aged horses. We're not the same hundred horses as last year, and they were phenomenal. Um, and and you and I were talking a couple big pieces. One, the style is changing. These horses were up. They were balanced, they were alert, their ears were working, they were happy, their attitudes, but I saw them under high control and truly waiting on their rider way more than we've seen in our lifetime. And the approach to the stops were big ones. You know, that that spring squirt stuff we used to see all the time, that, that stuff's gone. And these are all aged horses that know a lot. They can anticipate, and they're not. So the schooling, everything that the, the, the pros are doing, the riders are doing with these horses is working because the exhibition, the competition is phenomenal. It is, yeah. And, and there's, there's no question about that. I, like I spoke about earlier, I think, you know, we thought last year was good. And, uh, oh, my goodness, it's like I, uh, I, I, I wished I could have been there with you again this year to sit and watch every one of those things live like you had the opportunity to do. But, the, you know, the ones that I got to see – um, you know, on the, on the computer, it was, uh, that's again, that's a, it's the best raining I think I've ever seen. You know, I mean, there's no, there's no question about it. I, we thought that last year. So, um, I, yeah, I just, the horses have gotten so much better. You and I had this discussion before we even started the show. You know, I'm a guy that has done this for a really, really long time and had some, had, you know, a lot of nice horses. I may be in my lifetime had one for sure, maybe two that could have made the top 10 on this group of horses. And that's talking about in a lifetime, not, I mean, we looked at 90 of them that, you know, that, that right. all could have made the top 10 if they'd got shown properly. And I mean, I'm just in awe of how much better they've gotten and not just the training techniques the sports medicine, all that kind of stuff, but I'm talking about horsepower. These things are just crazy good and, and lasting so much longer than they used to. So Well, yes, and let me give you a couple simple numbers. You're talking about 62 head of horses out of 92 that were all marking 220 and better. That's 73 and a half. There's no doubt about it. I had one of those, you know, in my time. Um, I had one. You had several. The, the top 40 
42 to 45 horses. We're marking 222. That's 74s. And then, of course, you've got, we've got the top 10, and the cutoff was 226 and a half. That's 75 and a half, with a top score of 230 being a uh, 76.6. When you do the math in reverse, that's what it comes out to be. We actually saw individual scores to 77 and a half. So you're talking about 100 head of horses that are capable of marking 74 to 77 and a half. Um, and you got to sort it out. And that's what we just saw now for the second year in a row. And what's going to be fascinating, because you and I have done the analytics on the last two fraternity finals, is, is you know, last year's three-year-olds, but take the last two years, those three-year-olds are now four- and five-year-olds. What is that? If, if we as an industry keep producing that forward, I think there's nothing, but it's it's going to be great. It's going to be phenomenal. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> yeah. There's there's, and I don't want to. Like I said I don't want to beat. I don't want to beat this horse to death. But again, <laughs> what you know, something that you just you just talked about right there. You know, the number of horses that we had marking the two twenty and above. And again, it's you know, I I will just briefly mention that again from the scoring system. And you know, we we you and I have talked about for five years. Heck, we've talked about it for ten years. The need for more tools in the toolbox. And, you know, the way to separate those horses from from the 10th or eighth, same even from the 8th, 7th, 8th horse, 6th, 7th, 8th horse down to that, you know, 20th horse is, you know, there's a, and I just got done monitoring a show at Tulsa. I can, I can, uh, we had seven or eight horses tied at a 222. And I told the judges that that was going to happen before the class started because, yep. I said, there's no way around it. I mean, you've got horses that, derby horses that can plus a half everywhere. At least that's what you're going to have. And is it good? No, but it's all they have to work with. Correct. And we'll keep working on that. Um, Pull up the leaderboard because in the top 10 horses, um, I think there's three sets of ties. And mathematically, you have to. Here's the leaderboard of the top 10 coming out of 102 head of horses and you have three sets of ties and you have to mathematically because you only got three and a half points that you split them up with so it it's it it's inevitable and you're correct when you go out there um and and work these events jody so that's 100 percent correct is it time to make some of those advancements i've been a strong proponent of this for a long time uh, not only are ties Ties dilute not only the achievement of success in competition, but it also dilutes the records over the long haul. And since we our industry is so heavy on earnings, which is money earnings, that's another conversation we could put into our show. We could do a non-pro leveling and, and ranking system because like other sports, um, is it money earned as opposed to volume of competition beat you know when the the fedex cup champion the super bowl champion it's not about the score or how much the champion wins versus the reserve champion wins it's about a measurement of success of winning so i i question us as a sport and an industry if especially when you start talking about world rankings but could we not have national rankings that lead to world rankings that are actually based upon um, a different mechanism than just purse money? I don't. I think purse money's got value, but I don't think that that's the right measurement. That's just me. Yeah, no, I could. I couldn't agree more. And there's certainly a there's certainly a way to do that. I mean, you can look at the U.S. team ropings. Who have a group that decide where that rider's handicap should be leveled at. You have American sports writers that decide which college football team is going to be ranked where before the season starts. I mean, there's there's certainly a much more accurate way to do this than how much money you've won. Mm-hmm. That's college rankings. That's an interesting one. Yep. So, yes, there's plenty to look at. Let's waltz through a little bit of the analytics and get on with the meat and potatoes because we got a lot to do. Um, I think the most interesting point is, as an industry, depth of competition at the best of the best, which is about the Open. The beauty of the Open is anybody can come play. Non-pros are welcome to come play. They just proved it. A non-pro just whooped them. Um, 
Penalties are not the factor. Penalties are not separating up our competition anymore. This is about how good um, the competition is, and it's truly the analysis of how good, um, how great. And so the pressure is now making very fine distinctions on quality of high-level skill and athleticism. That's where we are as a sport. There's no getting around that. Um, So uh, the other piece is the industry has always been focused on what the final score is. And when they see individual scores that you drop the high and the low and you sum the middle, then they all have this little reaction buzzy bee kind of thing because when they see a two-point spread and the difference between a 75 and a 77, then everybody gets kind of goofy. Um, we've got to shift the focus because it's, well, here's the point. 75 and 77 are really good runs. Boom. Done. So... What's the rest of the story? And the story is inside. How do you get there? And I can give you tons of stuff because, and I'll give you some examples, but let me just put it in simple terms. Um, You take any one of those runs and drop the high and the low, and you have two 76s and a 75 and a half, and you sum those up. The two 76 scores did not get there the same way. That's what's really fascinating when you look at the competition along the way. It's not that one's better than the other, but it will tell competitors and it will tell fans um, what that quality kind of means and where it can go. Because a horse that can stop and roll back both ways, extremely exceptional as opposed to one way versus the other way, is is something to be thinking about and looking at it's 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 like um i I don't care what other sports you you know uh phil mickelson used to be able to do those golf shots backwards that's cool stuff so it's kind of along those analogies but um the detail that we're going to get into is getting off the end score and getting into how those scores come about because just like what I just said, you're talking about the top 45 horses are all marking 74s and betters. So now comes when you put more data points in, the outcome becomes more distinct. And I would tell us at a sport, we've got to truly start looking at and analyzing some different ways because I think the days of dropping high and low are getting close to being behind us. You and I have a great conversation about some of those differences, but Bear with me, because at the top of the game, does the game have to be played at the bottom and the top the exact same? No, it doesn't. It, it, it doesn't. It's, it's like you and I going to play golf. Are we going to tee off from the yellows, the golds, the whites, the blacks? Which ones? So, the red. Uh, it, yeah. <laughs> the, and, and, and when we shoot below par, we think we're stars. Right. Yeah. But we're not. No. <laughs> so, um, 102... Uh, entries in this whole thing, top 10 spots. Um, I'm going to pull up a graph real quick because I want uh, final score range, 226 and a half to 220. Um, The actual five cards was 74 to 77 and a half. I already said that. So there's your range, which is still a three and a half point differential. And three and a half points... Now, this graph shows us the depth of competition in the top 10. And what it's showing us is that 62% of all maneuvers in the top 10 runs were plus ones. That's what it's saying. The blue bar is how many times the maneuver score of zero, which is correct maneuver, in the top 10. Top 10 runs, seven maneuver pattern 350 maneuvers were marked in the top 10. The correct maneuver score of zero was done 1.7%. It was the extreme minority. Plus one and a half was applied 6%. Plus one was applied 62%. And plus half was used, uh, what is that, 32? The screen's got me. And the point, the point is 
what we've always been saying is they don't use the scale. Yeah, they do. Um, it's 30.3% is plus half. So between plus half and plus one, you had 92% of all maneuvers in the top 10 horses. That's where this competition was. And then I can tell you that the top three or four, how did they rank out the way they did is because those top three or four runs also were pulling plus one and a half across that run because that's where the 6% is, which is, you know, three times more than the average maneuver of zero. And so as a sport, and this is why I use that term, we've made it. We're here. This is where we are. And this was 40 horses out of 100. So, you know, this isn't chump change, and this is splitting up how good stuff is. You know, those guys that sat on the bubble to making this cutoff, um, I mean, I remember the days of being the next 10 or 15, 20 horses below the cutoff to go to the fraternity finals. Um, you know, those are long drive homes. Uh-huh. When you got a 74 horse and you don't make the top 10 to go to the run for the million, that's, you know, that's kind of humbling. Yeah, I mean, it, it's in, it's incredibly humbling. And I looked at some of those earlier runs. Let's see, maybe Matt Mills would come to mind. He was maybe a 226, just maybe missed it by a half point or something like that coming back. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, when I got done watching him turn around and go watch him stop, and I'm like, he's in easy. Oh, guess what? He didn't make it, right? I mean, it's like, and and I, I mean, I make good argument for it because these guys were better. But it's, I mean, you know, you, you I would have walked out of that pen thinking, I'm going to go play golf because I got this. I'm going to get another <laughs> turn here in August, right? But I come back going, you got to be kidding me. But uh, no, it was, it was, I mean, the, yeah. I And I laugh because, of, you know, we we're talking about the stats on this thing. And even at this level, part of the, part of the thing that makes the Rain and Horse such a great sport is, you know, the fan and the owner's passion for the sport itself and you know you've heard me say this again too but it doesn't make any difference if you're marking a 75 and a half and a 77 and a half that 77 and a half judge is the smart one and not other guys the idiot right i mean the mark the 75 and a half it's like it's just the way it works so anyway i uh yeah i mean there's a lot to be said with the average system in a deal like that so anyway continue it's great information yeah. Well, now I, I want you to pull up um, pull up the graph of uh, the stacked bar because we're going to go into um, the, on the simple numbers. The spreads were a hundred percent normal. Um, yeah. This one. This just shows you this graph. Ten horses make the top ten. Forty percent of those. Four of those horses had maneuver spreads of one point inside those runs. So four out of the ten runs had maneuver spreads of one point, and we're going to look at that. And then two of those runs, which is twenty percent, had maneuver spreads of one point um, two or more times. And we're going to look at those runs. And it's interesting because Gina Marie that wins it is one of those um and i think mandy was the other one we're going to look at all four of the runs that had maneuver spreads of one point now the fascinating thing of a maneuver spread of one point is that those spreads are either from zero to plus one or they're from plus half to plus one and a half and in all of those cases they are how good something is and then comes the conversation that you were making reference to because the the judge that marks it on the high side, everybody thinks is the superstar, and the judge that marks it on the low side, everybody thinks is a dummy. And so the answer is everybody needs to take a breath and look at what's really going on, and this is, you, Jody says, it's in the middle, and... 99.9% of the time that is correct and mathematically that's fascinating and we're going to look at some of those examples um show me pull up the stack graph of all 10 runs with the maneuver scores stacked yep please 
This is a fascinating graph because this looks at all 10 runs. It labels the riders. So you got Jason. It's not in sequential order. So there's no order from left to right here. But all 10 of the finalists, this is each of their runs. From Jason Land, Van Landingham to the left and Trevor Dare to the right. And what this graph shows you is the maneuver scores per run, all five scores put in. So for that run, like, for example, in Jason's case, um, he, he's his entire run, seven maneuvers, is plus, the reds are plus half, the yellow are plus one, green is plus one and a half, and blue is a correct maneuver score of zero. So again, I told you that the zero maneuver score was a minority, one point less than 2%. Well, guess what? There was only two runs that even had zero maneuvers in it. The other eight runs are all plus half to plus one and a half. But what's really fascinating, and if you look at Gina, who wins it, and why does she win it? Because when you, well, there's a lot of things, and she whooped them, so that's the why. But when you look at the scores and how we got there, not only does she use the entire, does she display and the officials use the entire scale from zero to plus one and a half? Yes. What does Gina do that the rest don't do? Pulls more plus ones and more plus one and a half than any other competitor. And that's what this graph is um, showing. Casey Hinton is right in there as well because he pulls a plus one and a half. Danny Trembley, see the green bar at the top on Danny's? He pulls a significant amount of plus one and a half out of that maneuver. It's really fascinating when you start to look at what's actually happening and you've got to put it into the run itself, which is where we're going to go. But anyways, um, this is a very cool display and then when you talk about well i would have done this and i would have done that that's nice and you can have that feeling and reaction but the officials did this and this is exactly what the officials say and then comes my point which is five data points is more significant than one two three or four we don't use four so it's one two three or five but this is using all five data points across the top 10, and it's fascinating. So let's, uh, shall we take um, a look? Anything you want to add in there, Jody? No way. I'm, 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 I'm still in awe listening. <laughs> well, let's, before we run, and we'll, we'll do, uh, I'm going to tell you real quick. Give me two seconds here because the two runs, um, Gina Marie had two maneuvers that had spreads of one point. Uh, her left circles, she went from a plus half to a plus one and a half. And her left rollback, she goes from a zero to a plus one. So she has two maneuvers we're going to look at. It. Mandy happens to have on uh, Starlight's Voodoo, Mark's a 227 and a half, right on. She has three maneuvers that have one point spreads at the maneuver level, and it's both sets of spins and the right circles. And um, it's fascinating because all three of those maneuvers, she goes from a plus half to a plus one and a half. Um, her score spreads, she ends up marking a 227 and a half. Her score spreads are from a 75 and a half to a 77, which is exactly what we were just talking about. And so that's fascinating, but let me give you the simple comparison because Gina Marie marks a 230. Her spreads go from a 76 to a 77 and a half, which is, which is really, it's a half point. It's a half point differential between those two. Um, and, and it's just, it's fascinating because we're talking about very good and excellent stuff. Um, and it's not about right and wrong. It's about detail of excellence. And I, I, I think it's really fascinating. Danny Trembley is another one. Um, he has two maneuvers that have one point spreads. They're both from plus half to plus one and a half. One is in the left spins and one is in the left rollbacks. And so we will look at that and we can, we can identify why that happens. 
And then we're going to talk about Jody because you always have been a strong proponent about there's really two boxes, not three, not four. The good news is none of them crossed one. There was only three penalties out of um, 70 maneuvers in the top 10 are scored. There's only two pen three penalties applied. They're not significant. And they don't even get to zero, let alone get to a poor maneuver. So this is all on the plus half and above, which is way cool. So our winning run, not only a woman, but a non-pro, and the technical aspect of control is where our sport now is, and this is a great example of it. So we're going left. One, two, three. Wow. Excellent. Yep. And that's, that, that technical piece of control at the end but they four ones in one one and a half here we go to the right two three and wow outstanding you know th anyways and that set of four one and a halfs and one one and there's the difference and technically the right spin was a, just a little bit more controlled and underspin time to go lope she steps on the gas away you go and I mean, you know, here we are. If this isn't pleasing to watch, now she's a little bit to the inside of the middle. She's safe, what I would call there. Yes. yes. Yeah. Agreed. But, you know, willingly guided, high degree of difficulty. Well-balanced yep. horse. Yep. And see, she comes right back and waltzes right across the middle there. So wherever, whatever you were thinking about on the first one, but this is still very good stuff. And slow down and a nice mover and well-balanced and time to change and boom, changes. And she changes one stride beside, beyond the middle, but no penalty. And it's just what your mind would expect as opposed to what she did. Steps on the gas pedal. This thing is rolling right across the middle first set of circles all five plus one Whew. you know one stride before the exact middle this horse says yes ma'am high degree of difficulty middle change boom uh, two plus one and a, two plus one and a half. This is that's one of the maneuvers that she has a one point spread. One plus half, two plus ones, and two plus one and a half. I call it very good. I mean, I I am for a one. I think a plus half is conservative. Yep. And this is her other maneuver, and the fundamental reason is one he gets just a little bit in his mouth and the rollback's a little rough. And that maneuver she spreads. She gets two zeros, one plus half, two ones. And that that's the why. Right. And I mean and I'm in agreement. There's some mouth around the end on this horse, you know, not uh, that makes But up then he all. comes back here yeah. and exactly. there's the real deal. Exactly. And, so anyway, I, like I said, the, our toolbox isn't very big. I just have to figure out uh, if there is a way for the horse, another horse that stops like that, but doesn't have a little mouth and a little resistance right here, just a little bit, even though it's very small. Do I figure out a way to give one more credit? I, that's my only issue, but this is just yep. way fun to watch. My goodness. Yep. And again, very good. Yep. And it's almost unanimous on the right rollback. This is outstanding. And this is where she pulls. What does she do across this entire run? Pulls more plus ones and more plus one and a halfs than any other competitor. And that's how she gets to the top. And good for her. The right rollback straight across the board plus ones. The stop and back, she's got four plus ones and one plus half. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, and that's right where they're supposed to be. The interesting point, you take that left rollback. And just take, um, you know, two and a half points because that's what they marked her across five data points. And it's 0.83, which is, so you, if you use math, you'd round it up. It's 
it's plus one. One. So th- you got a plus half or a plus one. That's what it is. That's what it should be. That's what the system says it is. And there we go. Yeah, exactly. And that was that would have that would have been a fun one to see live. It, it actually was. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, the only bad news is you weren't there this year, but that run, you know, marks a 76 to 77 and a half ends up Mark. That's the spread. So, you know, she's got two 76s, two 77s and one 77 and a half. You throw out the high and the low and there you go. And that's a prime case of what I was talking about because the two 77s did not get there the same way. They didn't. The score is the same, but they didn't get there the same way, and, and that's we've, fascinating. Yeah, we've had that same. We've had that same thing working with other judges ourselves. I mean, we have both. Heck, you and I have, you know, in the Rainer Stop show, you and I have judged and, and have two seventy fours. But I want to circle. You have to circle. You want to turn. I have to turn. So it's. Yep. Yep. Agreed. So let's uh, let's take a look at Danny. Danny Trembley, draw one thirty. Um, two twenty nine. That's what he ends up with. Here he comes, and it's his first spin that he's going to spread from plus half to plus one and a half, and that's part of it. See how he turned butt just a touch. Mm-hmm. And that's my point about where we are as a sport technical. But he pulls um, one plus half, three plus ones, and one plus one and a half, and that's why. Now he says turn, coming to the right, misses cadence just a touch. That's the why. Two plus halves, three plus ones. And do you do you not agree on that technical? I totally agree. And it's, I mean, there's, there's some, there's some spots that, you know, some judges are going to let something bother them a little bit more than the other. And, you know, we've had that discussion in the past a lot. And that, that is within our, within our judging license to allow that to happen. And as professional horsemen, we get to do that too. So. Yeah. Right across. Yes. And I agree, but I think that's where. The monitoring, mentoring, education, and the technical aspect of where the sport's going. Because those technical spots is where we are, and we've got to teach ourselves how to make fine decisions about those. You can't now, you you can no longer just be forgiving about them. You've got to do something with it. Wow. Wow. Huh? Yeah, I mean, very good to excellent. It's like only two spots for it. Yep. I mean, yep. There was four plus ones and one plus one and a half on that set of circles. And then he a little wide going across the middle on that first circle. Um, just a little. It's where yep. he steered, but now you got pattern placement. Right. So he says, come here. And he's, yep. man and as precise as it gets three plus ones two plus one and a half on those circles and i'm a little now, for the one just because of the pattern placement personally yep, for me so because yep. that first circle yep. Mm-hmm. yep i would agree with you that's the technical these rundowns are just on all of them these and horses are so working. good wow. in front and so back over. Oh. oh. Um, two plus halves, two plus ones, one, one and a half. That's the other maneuver that he spreads from plus half to plus one and a half on. And again, maybe a little aggressive in the approach that time, just a teeny bit to start with, but still just so good in front and so hard back over that hawk. Yep. Three plus halves, two plus ones, and what you just made reference to was the technical. Another example. Yep. (sighs) 
you know, you and I've had this discussion about that, you know, about the, about the leveling system. And, you know, we had this discussion about Danny exactly. And I, I watch him and I, you know, letting this guy be eligible for like the level three is like letting Patrick Mahomes go back and play college <laughs> ball again. Right. I mean, it's like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Right. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, or, yep. Takes so good and got such good horses, man. <laughs> And that last maneuver, two plus ones, three plus halves, his final, he marks a 229 when you drop the high and the low. He spreads from a 75 and a half. He has a two point spread, 75 and a half to 77 and a half. Um, and you're really talking about those two maneuvers. The first spin, because he actually uses his butt to start the spin. Right. It's a technical detail. And that's where we are. Um, and that left rollback, the rollback itself was strong, but he had a little squirty there for two strides. And again, we're in the technical. So that's where we are. I think yep. it's, uh, let's take a peek at Mandy because she has three maneuvers that they spread one point on and they're in the first three maneuvers, both spins and circles. She marks a 227 and a half. And here she is. And she goes from a plus half, one plus half, three plus ones, and one, one and a half. A little different form than what we've been seeing, but still very good, I think. It, Yep, isn't that the truth? And one, two. Wow, very much so. Now on this spin, she gets two plus three plus has one plus one and one plus one and a half. And I, my guess is part of it's the form, because again, you know, your eye and your mind gets kind of um, um, rhythmic or or what you've been seeing, so that form might be part of it. Right. Yeah. And you know, guys are saying, you know, this is not off the standard of what we've been seeing with a little lower neck carriage, whatever, but cadence was still good. Form was good. And yeah, I have no issue marking that. Yep. And she's cooking here a little on an outside yep. bridle rein right there, perhaps, but still degree of difficulty is high, high. Yep. And just a touch to the inside of the middle, which is that safe spot. Yep. And, right. And she's right in the exact same path, but very, very good in degree of difficulty. And how pleasing is this? I mean, it's just, oh. That particular maneuver, she gets one plus half, three plus ones, and one, one and a half. And I would tell you it's in the, it's in the one category. Yeah, in the middle for sure. Yeah. And now she's leaning a little bit to the inside. Yep, and she's telling you because she's actually holding them just a touch. Right. Horse is peeking just a little bit. Right across the middle. It says, yes, ma'am. Precise. Plus ones. Um, four plus ones. One half. One plus half. Um, yeah, strong plus one all day. Yes. Very good. I'll say three plus ones, two plus halves. Your plus ones mathematically are definitely where it is. And the difference here is in front end in the stop and the rollback. And the scores said it. They unanimously, all, pl all five plus half that one. And that's the technical difference in the maneuver. That horse was a little bit proppy in his front end through the stop, and the rollback was half of what it was the other side. And then she comes back, and all five of them plus one the stop and back, which, yes. 
Yes. Backup saved that for sure. I mean, it's a yep. very fast, fluid, crisp backup. So, yeah, very good. Yep. Outstanding. And that's just a testament to what you were talking about because the skill level of the rider is all in the same batch about horsepower. She marks a 227 and a half. Her range is 75 and a half to a 77 across those five scores. Outstanding. Just unbelievable. Um, we're going to go take a peek at Mr. Trevor. This will be uh, fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it will. And Mr. Trevor, I'll bet you the judges committee is going to have a lot of homework to do here for the next several months. Would be my guess. If you wanted to gamble on the sport of raining, it's whether or not they try to adopt a rule here. And Trevor, um, four plus halves, one plus one. And I think the plus half is very good there. Accurate, yes. Got a little bit squirty. No, because of one leg. He gets three zeros and two plus halves. And it, it, it's a quarter. They're right. Agreed. <laughs> I mean, agreed. Time to go low. Steps on the gas, this thing goes. And, and now when you talk about, you know, style, we just watched four different horses that no two of them were the same. But they're all nice. And he says, slow down. Now, what everybody's talking about, and this is nothing but good, yes? Mm hmm. Correct. Wow. Um, he pulls all five. All five judges mark that a plus one. Steps on the gas pedal, steering to the left, across the middle. Whew. Ears go up. Wow. And then he says, he says, and the conversation becomes, did he slow him down because of his hand and how he cues his horse going across the top line of his neck? And in that set of circles, he, that's where the spread comes from. Um, he gets one zero and four plus ones on the left circles. And it's all about how he cues and communicates with his hand directly on that horse's neckline. And we'll talk about that in a second. Stop and roll. All five plus one. Agreed. Such a pretty picture, huh? I'll say. When you talk about balanced and motion. Pleasing to watch, huh? Oof. Wow. Wow. The rollback was a little, but not, anyways. Yeah. Um, right? That's, that's the technical difference in that, and he gets two plus halves and three plus ones. That's where the technical difference is. They see it, they know it, but they've got to make fine distinctions. In a half-point increment. Yep. And he says, come here. Wow. And how do they back better than that? I don't know. <laughs> um, I don't know. Now, myself, you know, I'm... I would have done the one and a half. They all five marked out a plus one. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah I, th I think the backup takes it to excellent. But, you know, like yeah. I said, we weren't sitting in the chair either. No. Um, okay, let's talk about that hand on the neck thing a little bit, shall we? Yes, please. Let's talk about it. 
you know, because I, I know exactly what happened, which is what happens in your mind. And the first one got your attention and it was very good. And it, you didn't have to think about it when he comes back for the left circles. And he's more obvious about the fact that he's talking to that horse through his hand on his top line. Your mind is now going through up oh, obvious cue. What does that mean? What do I do with it? And so go. What do you well, do? I, you know, and, and we've had some discussion about this in the past. I chaired the committee for five years. And, you know, there's a guy that's, I don't even know how much is Sean won to date. Seven million. I don't know. Yeah. Five million, six million, seven million. I don't even know. I don't, don't keep track of it. But, you know, Sean is, uh, I mean, he, he's a great horseman. I mean, a great horseman. And, you know, he's, uh, since he started coming into that show pen, he'll brush that neck on those horses in a large fast circle if they want to get a touch aggressive and not with that amount of pressure, but he'll lower that hand and rub on their neck. Casey Deary does the same thing. Casey probably learned it from Sean. So I'm just saying that we had discussion about that. And I'm like, okay, go ahead and do it too. I mean, if you want to, I mean, I'm just saying, it, is it, is it, does it look like it's in, inhumane to the horse? Does it look like it's a technical advantage to the rider? Is it, that I, you know, I don't know. We've, we've talked about, I say no. Um, I, I think that, you know, uh, I've mentioned, you know, every cutter that comes off a cow reaches down and grabs that horse's neck with the free hand to say, Hey, look, we're done. Relax. Um, you know, cutters, if they're coming in and they're going a little bit forward, a little aggressive towards a cow, you oftentimes see those guys will press down on that neck with the rein hand and that will help that horse stay balanced and not be so aggressive and move to the cow. So it, it's not like it's, it's not like it's new. It's maybe just been modified in this particular spot by Trevor on that particular horse. And, you know, I mean, I, he used it to a certain extent in the first set of circles, a yes, little bit, maybe the, did. you know, and, but certainly much more aggressively in the second set. But did the horse respond to that cue? Is yes. that any more than if he'd lifted his hand and taken a hold of that horse lightly and took the slack out of the curb chain? I, I'm asking you, is there a difference there between those two commands? I, I, simple answer. It, here's my point. Okay. He's using the rein hand to communicate to his horse. He's just doing it in a more advanced, another form. And does that violate rules? The answer is no, because he's communicating with the horse. What does the horse say when he communicates? Is yes, sir. And did he have to communicate more in the left circles than he did in the right circles? Yes, which makes the degree of difficulty in the right circles higher than the degree in the left. Is it Great. an unfair advantage? The answer would be no. And does it violate the rules? Because we've written in our rules any use of either hand to instill fear or praise. This isn't either of those. This is direct communication with your rain hand. And I would put it somewhere similar in the categories. You know, when we pitch slack and walk slack, those are all showmanship techniques that are communicating control between rider and horse. And when you and I talked about this earlier, your assessment to it was, I thought, 100% correct. And so that's the reality is the sport and the judges committee going to spend some time analyzing that and what's our reflex oh heavens we got to do something about it well no maybe you don't because you really got to look at what's going on and that's what we're talking about right i Absolutely. put it in the communication sense because it's your rain hand it's not the uh, it's not your free hand and it's not unfair advantage you are still communicating in a legally proper way. Now, the horse that responds well is going to get credit, and the horse that responds poorly is going to get fault. So no different than anything else. You pull on the bridle rein, he caps his mouth, you get fault. Yeah, exactly. It's, you know, it's, it's the same thing that, you know, I mean, I, I had mentioned when we were talking about this before, um, and this is years and years ago. And Andrea is like, obviously as good a horseman as that there is walking on two legs himself. And I mean, in the, the, the prize money that he's won and the, and, and the way that the guy looks on a horse. And I mean, it, you just can't say enough good things about him. And years ago, um, Andrea would kind of flip his hand when he was showing a horse at, and I was sitting judging him one time, like he was untangling bridle rein. Well, maybe the bridle reins weren't tangled and he had all that slack and he'd flip that and those things would duck back behind the bridle. And, you know, I mean, I had the chance to talk to him after that. I mean, a few weeks after that. And I said, look, 
Andrea, I said, you know, that horse doesn't duck back behind the bridle just because you're flipping your hand around. It's what you do to him at home after you flip your hand around. And he goes, yeah, I teach him that way, right? And I said, well, you know, it's just kind of like a modified bump, right? So I right. said, I'm not buying into it, and I'm not going to mark you when you do that. And you know what? The guy goes, okay, I can train without doing that. And he had, I've never seen him do it again. So, and he's won a whole hell of a lot more, you know, I mean, than, than I ever have. So that's, that's a horseman. He just, you know, he just needed it pointed out and he said, we're getting away from that. So Trevor, if someone decided that that was an unfair advantage or a judge didn't like to see it, they tell him and it's up to him to say, you know what, I'm going to keep doing it or I'll quit it. So I, I, I don't know that the judges committee is going to sit down and say, okay, well, we're not going to mark you if you do that anymore. I, you know, I don't know. Have talk about it. Absolutely. Go for it. But it doesn't look like it's an unfair advantage and it doesn't look like the horse is being intimidated. So just my No, I, it, it, and I a hundred percent agree, but if I do the simple math, because you're still talking about it, it's, it's, it's a plus half or a plus one maneuver all day. So allowing yourself as a judge to get a little bit uptight, not knowing what to do and sit on zero on that one is actually being too tough. Um, yes. And, and you got to be prepared to waltz through that stuff in your head and then decipher through what's actually going on. Um, and, and so the real answer is there because mathematically it's a point eight. That's what it is. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just, I'm just saying, you know, I've had, I've had a hundred of them. I could push on their neck like that and they go faster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, they wouldn't slow down. So it's like, right. yeah, I'm out of here. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Interesting. But yeah, great. And great conversation for sure. I would be interested. I would actually ask some people, I would ask for some, some of our viewers opinions on that just to see what, just to see what the mailbox would say. Um, yes. And, and we will go to cowboyoffice.com. Uh, by all means, you can drop it in, put it in the comment. It's an anonymous function. Uh, we're happy to spend some time. It's an interesting piece because again, what we're talking about is the technical details and we're now down to every step We're every step, every stride. If we've got motion in the pattern, we're now down to the technical aspects of what's going on and how good is the control that's where we are as a sport and so our officiating and our rules are gonna have to begin to keep up with that and it's not about stifling it it's about um making the assessment on excellence and so it, it, it in judges committee stuff it's like keep your head on straight get clear on what's actually going on and this is a prime case of where talking to having the exhibitors and the officials talk and work their way through this, no different than the days when we were talking about one step backing up before you rolled back, you know, that conver and we did, we, we had some workshops on, you know, the slide and then the difference between stepping back one step and rolling versus stand up and roll and that was a conversation of a group of people. And the bottom line was one backward step at the end of the stop was not where we wanted to go. And so they did. And those guys quit showing them that way. And all's yeah. good. Absolutely. There's, there are certainly a lot more things from an education standpoint that I would consider more important when we're talking with about one point spreads on maneuver evaluations. Um, than than Trevor using too much hand in a downward transition. You know what I mean? It's like we get one point spreads on horses that are in stop approaches. We get them on, you know, I mean, on, you know, if Danny's horse is using a hip when he turns first, how much is that supposed to bother a guy? Those, those to yep. me are, are harder issues than somebody using a uh, pressing down on a horse's neck in downward transition, especially if right. it responds. So, yep. Well, Trevor marks at 227. His individual scores, he has a two-point spread across all five, 74 to 76. That's fundamentally why. Um, and and he's on his way to the million, so good for him. You bet. Um, anyways, it's outstanding. So those are our runs with the spreads in them. Now let's go take a peek real quick. Um, let's, let's pull up Dan Huss. 
because there's two runs, Dan Huss and Jason Van Landingham in the top 10, that are just, this is my opinion, they're absolutely phenomenal, and it's, they're great displays of technical, and they have no mishaps, but these are runs that are all in the plus half to plus one categories, um, and I don't know, maybe Dan's got a spot in my heart because we're the same age, and he's doing phenomenal stuff, so good for him. But, um, you know, Dan marks a 227. He goes from 75 to 76. He has the least spread in all of the top 10. This is just... Great plus half across the board, yeah? Yes. Yeah. And he pulls four plus halves and one plus one. And does the exact same thing on that one. And that one just has that little bit of technical um, at the beginning, and he migrates back to where he was on the left spin. So... Again, we're in the technical details, but strong plus half. Yep, good, good. Yep. And I'm thinking very good to excellent right now as this circle is going on. How can you not? Yep. And right across the middle. Dead Did you see the center. ears go up on that horse? Boss, where are we going? Yeah, and dead center. In the, I mean, did oh. not cheat that circle to the inside one bit. He oh. said, hey, this thing goes where I tell it to. And Look. again... Twice. Yeah. Oh. Can it be done better than that? I, <laughs> I mean, I mean, look I, at I, that. I, yeah. I know we say it doesn't have to be perfect, but. Yeah. Th how these were look? ones. Yeah. If those aren't excellent, I don't know what is. Yeah. And, and he does. He, he pulls four plus ones and one plus one and a half. I would tell you they're one and a half. So I would one. tell you that they are excellent. Not very yeah. good. They're excellent. Yeah, it's one of the best examples of excellent that I've ever seen. I mean, just if you pleasing to watch, watch his horse's attitude and his ears and balance and consistency. But the pattern placement damage. is the issue. We've seen, we have already seen a bunch of plus one circles that have shaded, you know, two body widths to the inside on the right circles. This horse did not do it. It has to be better. Yep, I agree. And he pulls all five plus ones, but what we're talking about is one and a half. And mm. so that's, that's all. Phenomenal set of circles. Yeah. So soft around the end, very calm. God. Great approach. Whoa. Right there, he had just a yeah. set in one stride. Just right before he pulled the trigger, but still got to be good. Yep. yep. And he pulls, that's all five plus halves. And that's the why, mm -hmm. because of that one stride. So, again, that's a technical aspect of the illustration of technical. And, again, this horse is so good around the end for me. I mean. And. If that rollback would have been stronger, it would have been. He gets three plus halves, two plus ones, and it's the rollback that probably kept it from all five right. being plus ones, would plus be my ones. guess. Yeah. Right? Yep. He looped it just a teeny bit. I mean, not. Yep. Yep. The loop. When we were talking earlier, this is a great example of these horses waiting on these riders and, and age. This horse, look at him. He knows where he's going, but he's waiting on to hand to tell him. When it's time to speed up and away you go, he pulls, um, this one's all five plus one. Has and, to be very good. I mean, yep. good, very good approach, very good stop, and a great backup. So, yeah, I'm, I'm all about that. yep -er. So, you know, and good for Dan. He gets qualified. He's on his way, 227. His spread is a one point between the five scores, 75 to 76. And that's where it is. It's, it's, you know, they all are in the same spot. It's between plus half and plus one. Every maneuver across the entire board. Phenomenal. Yeah. And Dan's horses look so good. And I, I, would, I would be, 
I'm a guy that's, you know, anything can happen with horses, but if I'm going to bet on one horse not changing between now and August, it will be that one. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> if I'm going to say one's going to circle the same way in Vegas as it did here, it's going to be that one and turn yeah. and stop the same way too. So yeah. it may be even be better, but anyway, yeah. I'm all about that. Yeah. Well, there's a great example of, um, if we use that to educate ourselves, because if you wanted to find excellent circles, there's a great example. But we've seen, we've seen several of those already. That's where our sport now is. So the difficulty, and I think the rollback is always going to be one of our difficult ones because one, it's a hard physical thing for horse to do. Two, they're not all going to be as good both ways, and our. Th- then three is our ability as officials to make those fine distinctions is what, where we got to go. And then uh, your point of not enough tools, because those fine distinctions now have got to be deciphered better than what we're doing because we, we, we let them get patchy. It has to. And, and we can't right now. It's not enough. I mean, I'm just thinking about that horse as it, as it goes around the end of the pen very, very relaxed and no mouth whatsoever. And then he has a little bit of a hiccup in the approach. So Gina Marie's comes around the end of the pen and we've got not significant, but we've got some mouth going around the end of the pen, which says uh, maybe it's a horse that's a little apprehensive about what's coming. I I don't even know the reason, but, and then she busts it, runs down there and stops with absolutely. So where is the balance point in there? I mean, if Dan's horse would have gone around and stopped the same way, is he better because there was no mouth around the end of the pen? Or does she get more credit even with a little mouth around the end of the pen because she ran and stopped? I mean, so those are spots that we can't, we we aren't educating our guys enough on because some guys will go, yeah, no, it doesn't bother me. I got to see the stop more than the around the end of the pen. Somebody says, "Mm, no. And, you know, just like we're talking about, it's like there's, there's, there needs to be more tools for sure. Well, I agree. And then your ability, using the comparative, um, two different approaches of the competition, Dan's horse and Gina Marie's. Gina Marie's is a little bit more physical, and she showed that. So the stop itself, more physical, and the ability for Gina Marie's horse to roll back was more physical than Dan's. But I 100% agree with what you're talking about, which is in the finesse and some of those other pieces. And I don't have that answer either. Right. Um, and no, we're not taught and educated on priorities of those either. Right. And that's exactly the technical difficulty of where the sport now finds itself. But across five data points, what the officiating said across five data points was that Gina Marie's was a little stronger. And my guess is it's because it was a little bit more athletic. Right. Um, I mean, that horse, when it stops, it's, it's stopping and its front end is extremely um, free and balanced. And when it comes back, you know, it rolls those, those kind of trashes are pretty physical. I mean, they, they can fold over themselves. Oh, I think that's fantastic. And it's the same, you know, all those are, those are, those are technical aspects that your judges committee is responsible for and teaching guys how to mark those and giving them the tools to mark them with. It's no different than Dan circles. Um, Mandy's Palomino horse that shies to the inside on those circles. Um, and Dan's hits a dead center on the circles and probably even a little prettier mover, but why do they get marked the same? Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, and I think when you use a comparative, Dan's was between the reins the whole time, both sets. Sure. Where where Mandy's wasn't it, it wasn't violating a general, but was leaning to the inside on the left set of circles, where Dan's was truly between them. That would be the technical detail difference when you compare. Absolutely. Right? And and placement. You know, if one yep. horse is shying, cheating those right circles a little bit, because if I get too close to center, I might change a lead. And the other one goes. No, I'm going right through here. So, yep. way fun. I mean, good, good oh, makes for good conversation. Oh man! Well, this is it, this is the great analysis, and it's the stuff that we used to dream about. Um, let's pull up Jason Van Landingham because he's in a similar category. Jason marks a two twenty eight. Um, his spread across five data points is seventy 
four and a half to seventy six and a half. So it's a two point um, spread. But when you talk about uh, clean, I mean no errors, and it's all about how good. Uh, it's another great example. Whoa. And right at the slowdown, one, that's it. That's all you could do about it. He gets uh, uh, one, two, three, four, four plus ones, one plus half. And on this one, he gets two plus ones and three plus halves, and the difference is in the cadence. Um, and the first set's definitely stronger than the second set. Off he goes. Between the reins, just a touch to the inside. Inside, yep. The rest of the yep. But still high, high degree oh. of difficulty and willingly oh. guided and pleasing to watch and just... and. Placement keeps me from going excellent, but I'm still yep. very good. I would 100% agree. But just, yes, yeah. right on it. A little bit of a exaggerated change, but not an issue. Plus one across the board. All five of them mark at a plus one. Not a problem. And again, between the reins, across the middle. Chain. Four plus ones, one plus half. And I think the ones were very good. Good. Yep. when we talked about every one of these horses on the rundowns is waiting. And that to me is one of the... What do you think? Excellent. Oh, buddy. Four plus ones, one plus half. The ones have it. And I was even a little stronger on it than that. I called it an excellent stop and roll back <laughs> just because the thing was so... You know, and I'm, I'm pushing it. Very good, excellent. Yep. Two spots for it. Yep. Not quite as good back over the hawk, but went yep. deep. Horse didn't say no. What do we have for markings there? Four ones and one half. They did exactly, all five judges did exactly the same on both those rulebacks. They're not exactly, the, they're not equal, but they got to the same end point. And he wanted to set just a touch. Yep. He got a little shaky when it came time to back up because he wasn't sure where he was going. And all five of them plus and a half. And my guess is that's why. Because, again, those technical things, they saw it, they dealt with it, right? Yep. yep, exactly. And maybe not quite as good in front as the other two stops, too. But not, not bad. But, I mean, yeah, I th I I'm, yep. I'm for good also. Yep. 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 And that's so he marks a 228. Um 74 and a half to 76 and a half. This is a prime case of, you know, the 74 and a half is the dummy that you talk about. And 76 and a half, we think is yeah. an all-star. <laughs> right. Um, and that's, it's, it's actually not true because it's, it's really, it, it, it's the culmination of when you put them together. I would then tell you is the rest of that analysis is adding them together 
serving us the best? That's the bigger question. These are clear examples of how you can use mathematical data endpoints based upon expert analysis, decision-making, and have an even more dynamic output for a sport because every one of these runs, we're, we're in the same category. These are all 74 and a half to 77 and, and a half runs. That's what they are. So guess what, folks? You got to make a decision and split it up. And it's not about what you like, Jody, and what I like. It's about what it's just whether we compared Dan circles and Mandy circles or Gina Marie's stop and roll back and Jason's stop and roll back. You can do that in any one of those. You can do it across 10 horses, but we're talking about that technical detail of where we are in the sport. And I, I think it's a fascinating place to be. It, it is. And you know, we, we've always taught, you know, when, when you were on committee, when you chaired the committee, you, had, you taught exactly the same, the same thing. And, you know, I've, we always have heard this, but we don't judge by comparison. And it's true, we're not supposed to judge by comparison, but it is a very, very valuable educational tool. And when, if I monitored a major event, we certainly would compare runs from Friday's 217 and a half to Monday's 217 and a half to make sure that they were the same 217 and a half. In other words, that educational tool for those judges in the morning before they went to work was judging by comparison because it's the only way to ensure that you're going to have the, the playing fields level before they go to work. So when I talk about the, you know, the comparison between Mandy circles and between Dan circles or Gina stops and approaches, it's, it's, it's for educational purposes. It's for people that are watching this show to see what I see, what you see. So right. anyway, just for right. And, and the fact that we all see it, the difference is the hardness, the, the hard requirement in having to make a decision and stand behind it versus having an opinion sitting in the seat or any of the rest of that. Having the opinions easy, um, making the hard decisions hard, and then being consistent with it. And I agree with you on the comparative analysis and which will lead us to what we've got to talk about, um, which is the standard because there's two parts of the standard. One is the industry, which is the sport and what it's going to display to you. And that's not standing still. This is a phenomenal example of it. Um, because everything that we've just seen is all plus half to plus one and a half stuff. That's forward, upward movement of a industry standard. And then comes our expertise standard and the things that are going to make you and I make those decisions. The mouth, the, the obvious cue, the response to it, the set in the stride before the stop, all of those kinds of things. And, and, as an industry, I think that's where we need some work because we need our mentors and I think we need some workshops because I think the exhibitors got to spend time with the officials in talking about those details for the sport, not about for me, for right. the sport. That's a difference because when they get in those workshops, they'll talk about what's for me versus what's for the sport we just watched uh, i don't know how many horses did we just run six seven style is real because it's allowed to be varied we just saw it no two of these horses were the same but they're all good we saw up and and but balanced and collected and we saw very flat top lines and collected and so we're seeing all those variances, um, but the standards where we've got a lot of work, individuals, yours and mine, as well as where that applies to the industry. Absolutely. And I, you know, I mean, I, I give a couple, couple of examples of, of how, how far we've come. All you would have to do is try to find, you know, an old 
an old DVD of NRHA's Judges Committee's first maneuver evaluations and take a look at what was a zero to a plus one and what is a zero to a plus one now. I mean, it would be ridiculous, right? I mean, it's like watching the Futurity winner from 35 years ago and watching one now. It's like you think at that time they're as good as they can possibly be and they look like a green two-handed horse then compared to what they are now. So, and I, I would talk about the riders and the, I mean, or I think the exhibitors meetings with judges, I think that is, you, you know, Mandy Brumley was progressive enough years ago that she had me do one of those um, or a couple of them in Vegas, you know, when I monitored that show um, and exhibitors loved that the chance to be able to talk to a judge and to ask and to look at, you know, look at maneuver evaluations and to ask questions. And, and uh, you're a hundred percent right. There's a lot more of that that needs to happen. Well, uh, let me ask you one other question because we're going to wrap this one up. And that is the business, the, the conflicts between officiating competitors. And let me ask you this, because is there a correlation between what, Great officials and great riders, trainers, do they have to be the same? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, you, you and I have had this discussion. We even had this discussion with our, with our president and president-elect that, that, you know, the National Football League, the officials for the National Football League who are in charge of spending a hell of a lot more money or <laughs> passing out a lot more money than, than we are, we are. Um, you know, th those aren't the best players, right? And I've, I've had some riders come to me and tell me that, you know, years ago, some guys that were very successful riders tell me what I needed to be doing with the judges committee. And, you know, it's kind of like it, my, my comparison was the same. That's like, you know, some of the highest, you know, paid football players in the NFL telling the referees how to do their job just because they're very good at their sport doesn't mean that they're very good at officiating. So, you know, from an officiating standpoint, there is so much conflict now. I don't care what you say. I mean, there is, it doesn't matter wherever you go, there's going to be some conflict. And, there's you're a, talking about you're talking about business conflict. Business conflicts, yes. I'm talking about I'm talking about and and I think by and large it's it doesn't affect us from the official standpoint, but there are ways to get it to be even better than it is with a with an officiating system and a crew that um perhaps we don't have guys that are active in involved competing. Mm -hmm. I mean, so and I agree. I think there's common denominators, but I think as a sport, because we're kind of making the stance that the, the sport has graduated. So we're, we're, we're at this level. And as we take this level, is there a step that, because from a career standpoint and a professional, being a professional official, that that's what you excel at and you put your, Jimmy Kaiser talks about being a student in the game. Being a student in the game as an official would be, very different than being a student in the game of being a competitor exhibitor. And so um, that's a little bit of the broader piece of kind of where we are as a sport. I think it's fascinating because the reflexes out in the industry, and this is true, I don't understand this. The American performance horseman thing that just happened a few weeks ago. Yes. When they announced the officials in the opening ceremonies, I, they thought, I don't understand this, but they made it a big deal of that those officials had rider earnings of some level and or were on committees for the regulatories. They made a announcement about that, so it just appeared to me that that was important to them. I find that the committee work would have some significance because you would then become a student of your skill level there's significance there but when you get into the regulatory functions versus the application there's another gray area there we can talk about it another time the rider earnings versus officiating skill i find fascinating that the industry thinks that those two are closely connected or correlated and so yeah it's it, it's yeah it's 
it's uh and i it's it's <laughs> i i will go back a, a, a long long ways to to give you this one because it was like i'd sit around a group of guys and it would have been it would have been when they would hang out at the fraternity when rick weaver and i would always stall together dale wilkinson my father obviously jack brainerd bob anthony and Jack Kyle would sit together in a row and they would talk about basically how bad a job we did when we went and showed our horses, all these old guys would, you know, poor Rick and I. But they would they would laughingly talk about judging all the time. And both of those guys and Bob, if I'm going to talk to you about this one and I'm sure you'll agree, but I always had heard when I was a kid that the worst judge reign in any of those guys have ever seen, Bill Horn and Loomis did. Right. So, you know what I mean? And those, those were the best that there was at the time, you you know, so take that for what it's worth. But there's some guys that, that knew about judging and they said the worst rider that they'd ever seen Mark, those two guys did together. So, right. The two best riders tried to judge it and they did a bad job. Exactly. I, I, I think it's a phenomenal example of it. I remember talking to Bill, um, I've got my own story on that one, but that is true. And talking to those guys because they did try it, but I give them a lot of respect because they knew that was not in their lane. And so they didn't put the effort into it and they didn't, which is fine. And they just stepped back and said, Nope, not for me. Yep. Right on. That's part of the graduation in the entire sport. And I would say this across all of them. And I think that there are very chronological spots as you go up in the sport, not only in rules and how you play the game, but the degree of officiating, which is no different than other. I use the tee boxes in golf. Um, You know, shooting par from the reds is very different than shooting par from the blacks. Just, just facts. So, Absolutely. And, and, you know, from the officiating standpoint, it's not like, you know, the professionals aren't supposed to have an opinion. They're the ones that are out in the doing business it. making a living doing it. They, they are the ones that actually are deciding what we want and what, I mean, this is where we want this industry to go and the direction we're going to travel. It's not like professionals shouldn't be involved. It's just right. like, there's some spots that they, from, you know, from that conflictual standpoint, it's, there's some spots that they, that they shouldn't be involved in. So well, and you can't do both. And I would agree because baseball with the time clock on the pitchers and the batters. And so they all mutually kind of gathered up last off season, came up with that. Now you're going to hear all the opinions as they all go do it. And the batters and the pitchers are already making fusses about it. That's fine. That's an example of what we're talking about. But that group of athletes that has to be implementing those new rules is different than the officials that have to enforce those rules and apply them. And, and they, they don't do the same. So you make very obvious choices on, I want to go down this path in this sport. Um, And I think the sports growing to a spot that there's even more choices because Mandy Brumley and, you know, produces the run for the million is working with Taylor on, on all these things. And so management and production is a whole nother place. Um, so there's opportunities to be involved in the industry, but I think that there's chronological places that you're going to have to make choices that you can't do it all and you can't be experts at it all. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. And like I said, there'll be, there, we could do a whole show about that too. So anyway, I mean, it's, well, it's good information. Then God willing, as long as we're still around, we'll have plenty of material to work on, right? You bet. Um, we've covered a lot. Is there anything that we haven't or that we don't need to? I don't think so. I think this is going to be a really, really good show. I think, I think, you know, to our viewing audience, I hope that we've, uh, I hope that we've offered you some some different opinions, and and uh, and uh, I hope you uh, hope you find it as interesting and as fun to listen to us as we have doing it. So it's uh, <laughs> it's good stuff. Um, Travis, if you would put up the top ten, please, as we kind of close it out, um, because I think, in all due respect, phenomenal reigning uh, over a hundred head of horses. You know, the top 10, there's going to be, I think there's now 17 that are actually qualified for the run for the million. This is a fascinating 
um, Gina Marie, Dana, Danny Tremblay, Cade McCutcheon in third, tied for fourth and fifth, Jason Van Landingham and Gianaro, Gianaro Lendy, um, fifth, f- tied, fourth, fifth, sixth, um, Mandy McCutcheon, tied for seventh and eighth, Trevor Dare and Dan Huss, and then tied for ninth and tenth, Martin Muehlstetter and Casey Hinton. Casey was another one. He had a phenomenal um, ride in this one. I was uh, really happy for him. Um, this is cool stuff, and I think it's even cooler because you're talking about now qualifying for an event in March, and the finals is going to be in August, and this is very different in the sport than – running a qualifying on Monday and having a finals on Saturday. And I, I, th- I think it's really healthy for the sport. Um, it also emphasizes the fact, and we're going to talk about this one on another show too, Jody, which is are the days at the top of the sport of having riders being able to enter multiple horses what does that mean for us? So the non-pro competing against pros, pros against non-pros, skill level and horsepower versus rider earnings. But then I would take you to another one, which is not only leveling, but how many entries can a rider mount up on? Um, we'll leave it at that. And there's more to work on. And uh, for our audience, we we do hope that This has brought some more thought and some more insight. And we're all about education, which is about informing our consumers and fans accordingly. The more you know, the better informed you are and the better you'll be. Um, So we hope you get a lot out of that. Remember to go to thecowboyoffice.com. If you haven't put your email in, please do follow along This show is going to be published only via video. We will not do it audio for obvious reasons. So remember to go to cowboyoffice.com, put your email in. Horses are good for people. And until next time, enjoy the ride. And until next time, stay in the middle. Today's episode is brought to you by 4D Productions in cooperation with the Consultment Agency, a full-service agency that helps bring forward-thinking equine brands into the 21st century using digital skills and services such as website development, graphic design, social media, and media production such as the podcast you're consuming here today. Thank you so much for riding along with us today. Sign up at cowboyoffice.com to be the first to know about topics affecting the industry we love so much. You can reach out to us with topics you care about by finding us on TikTok, Instagram, LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, and all podcast platforms. And remember, share this episode with someone that may enjoy it, because the more we can share our horses with others, the better our world will be.